Yeah, they told me I was the guest speaker today, so um, the song the choir just sang um, was written uh, by Isaac Watts um, many, many years ago based on Psalm 90, which is the scripture that we're going to look at today. So if you have your Bible, turn to Psalm 90. Uh, We want to look at these verses uh, today uh, as they pertain to us um, in 2019. It is truly a blessing when we can uh, gather um, and, and look at words that were written thousands of years ago in God's Word uh, that speak to our hearts today, but also uh, we can sing songs that were written uh, well before uh, our own day um, and know that there have been generations of believers who have sung and celebrated the great truths of the faith from those same words. And so uh, we want to... Um, to think about that uh, today as we look at God's Word. Uh, Before we read uh, these verses, in 1870, a group of explorers, um, surveyors, um, map makers, were traveling through uh, what is now Yellowstone National Park, and uh, they were mapping the the different geological formations and the different uh, things that they found there so they could put together a map so that people wanted to come visit would know where to go. And and they stumbled across a geyser, uh, which erupted with surprising regularity. Uh, They they, they timed it, and in just a few uh, hours they were there, it erupted eight times. Uh, And they could predict within a certain range of minutes how long that geyser would go between eruptions. And so they named it. It was unusual to name a geyser, but they named this particular one, and perhaps you are familiar with it. It received the name Old Faithful uh, because of its predictability, because it was something that could be... Uh, you, know, you couldn't set your watch to it, but you could pretty well guess when it was going uh, to happen. And today it continues to erupt on a regular and a predictable pattern. Uh, and tourists will gather, you know, to watch this eruption take place within a certain window of time. Uh, and, and we've sung about faithfulness today. We've heard about God's faithfulness to us. And it's the, it's the quality of being reliable, of being dependable. Something that's faithful is something that you can, you can kind of bank on it. You can guarantee that it's going to take place. And, and faithfulness, unfortunately, is something that's sorely lacking uh, in our world today in a lot of cases. Uh, people make promises they can't keep. And they know they can't keep them when they make the promises. We've all uh, been both the victim of someone who failed to keep a promise and we've all given promises that I'm sure that we couldn't keep. The point being is that faithfulness is something that we should strive to have in our own hearts and our own lives. But in order to have that, we need wisdom. We need wisdom to know what it is to be faithful. And so Psalm 90 gives us some direction today as we look at this issue. And so I want to read Psalm 90 as we look at what God's Word has for us this morning. As I mentioned last week as we started looking at some of the Psalms, many of them start off with these subheadings. They're, they're not part of the Psalm, but they're headings. Sometimes they're instructions about how, to, how they were to be sung in the ancient worship. Uh, others like this one are, are, are telling us who they're composed by. And this is the only psalm in the book of Psalms attributed to Moses. It says, a prayer of Moses. And I just love how Moses is described here, the man of God. You know, at the end of our lives, there's going to be people that are going to say things about us. But wouldn't it be wonderful if the one thing they said about us first and foremost was that we were men and women of God? That's how Moses was remembered in this psalm. So this is what it says, Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You return man to dust, and say, return, O children of man, for a thousand years in your sight are but as yesterday when it is past, or as a watch in the night. You sweep them away as with a flood. They are like a dream, like grass that is renewed in the morning. In the morning it flourishes and is renewed. In the evening it fades and withers. For we are brought to an end by your anger. By your wrath we are dismayed. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. For all our days pass away under your wrath. 
We bring our years to an end like a sigh. The years of our life are 70, or even by reason of strength, 80. Yet their span is but toil and trouble. They are soon gone, and we fly away. Who considers the power of your anger and your wrath according to the fear of you? So teach us to number our days, that we may get a heart of wisdom. Return, O Lord, how long? Have pity on your servants. Satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Make us glad for as many days as you have afflicted us and for as many years as we have seen evil. Let your work be shown to your servants and your glorious power to their children. Let the favor of the Lord our God be upon us and establish the work of our hands upon us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. Moses uh, composes this prayer. We don't know exactly the context, uh, but tradition tells us that he composed this prayer following the death of his brother Aaron and his sister Miriam. So at a point where he's, he's probably uh, deeply saddened by what he sees around him. And of course, if you know the story of, of Moses and, and the journeys to the wilderness, how the people, they, they complained, they grumbled, they rebelled against God. And, and he reminds us there in that very first word, Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. This idea that God is faithful to us. So there's two truths that we have to face, that we see in this psalm that are, that are laid out so clearly that, that I don't want us to miss them. The first truth that we must face in life, if we're, if we're going to live a life of faithfulness built upon wisdom that comes from God, is we have to understand the truth that, there, that this is true, that the awesomeness of God. The awesomeness of God. Now, we use that word awesome a lot. Maybe not as much as at some point in our life, but, but we'll say, well, that's awesome that that happened to you. That, that's awesome. But if you think about what that word is, the root of the word awesome is the word awe. It's the idea of awe-inspiring. It's the idea that, that it brings you to this moment of just total, complete awe. How is God described in Psalm 90. Well, he's described as being from everlasting to everlasting, of being eternal, of being timeless. That God is not affected by time, that God doesn't keep a watch, doesn't keep schedule. He just he just is. And he is eternal. He he doesn't change. He is absolutely awesome. And you see, one of the things that I think we desperately need today is a big picture view of God. You see, if God is small in our lives, in our thinking, in our way of approaching things, if God is small, then what we end up doing is is veering into what we could almost consider a practical form of atheism. Uh, Not that we don't believe that God exists, but we live our life as though God doesn't exist. We live our life as though everything depends on us if we have a small picture of God. But what we need is a big view of God. I think one of the biggest problems in American Christianity today is that we have made God small. We've made God small so we can understand Him. So that we can, we can find something practical and something you know, real and something that we can... We can you know, gravitate towards in our hearts. And the reality is God is big and awesome and wonderful. See, I think sometimes we like a God who is small because then we can, we can, we can understand Him, we can figure Him out, we, we know what we're dealing with, but that's not the God of the Bible. See, when God is big, we understand the true meaning of that word, all. That God is truly awesome. Awesome. That God is awesome, that He is worthy of all of our praise, all of our honor, all of our worship. You know, if you've never been in the presence of God and been absolutely dumbfounded and stricken with the inability to speak, you've never really been in the presence of God. If you can explain that it's not truly God, 
because God is awesome. That's why in Habakkuk, in the midst of him dealing with the issues that he's dealing with, he reminds us in Habakkuk 2.20, the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. The awesomeness of God. If we forget that, then we, we mess up because we begin to put things in their wrong place in our lives. You see, so many times we talk about priorities as if, you know, God's just one of many priorities. You know, put God first and put your, your family second, put yourself third, whatever. Kind of like you have a checklist. But that's not really the biblical model of priorities. The biblical model of priorities is that God takes precedent over everything in every area of your life. He's not part of your life. He's so awesome that He is the substance of what your life should be. The awesomeness of God. The second truth we have to face is the frailty of man. The frailty of man. We see this in the contrast that Moses portrays here between God and us. He, he, he talks about how we are but dust. That we are but dust. And one of the things that's hard for us to sometimes face, but we have to realize, is that one day we will die. That we are mortal. That we are not guaranteed forever in this life. That we are going to one day die. And, and Moses tells us that, you know, how long is life in the grand scheme of eternity? I mean, what's 70, 80 years in the grand scheme of eternity? But like that. It's like the grass coming up and then withering away. It just happens so quickly. In the grand scheme of eternity, what we think of as a really long life in, in God's eyes is really not that long. One of the saddest things I ever heard at a funeral. I, was, I went to a funeral, I wasn't part of the service, but I went to a funeral uh, for someone. A gentleman had passed away, and uh, the pastor that they got to do the funeral made, you know, and we preachers, we, we are guilty sometimes of just making some really dumb comments. Okay, I'm just going to be honest with you on that. Sometimes we just say things that we shouldn't say. But this preacher said something, and I just want to go up and smack him, because it was just the worst thing you could possibly say at a funeral. And he said to this, this person that had died, said they would live on... Because they would live on in the memories of the people they left behind. Now I hope you can see just how silly that statement is. Because think about it, there will come a day where everybody who knows you is gone. And everybody that they know is gone. So if you only live on in the memories of other people... That's really sad. That's really tragic. You know, we, we want to hold on to life and hold on as if we live forever, but the reality is that we will one day die. We are but dust. We're told here in this psalm that our sinfulness is deserving of God's wrath. And we don't like to think that God's wrath is applied to us. We like to think of it applied to other people that maybe have done us wrong or have, have done things that we don't agree with. We, we'd like to think that maybe they're the ones that deserve God's wrath, but we too deserve God's wrath. We forget that we are deserving of that as well because of our sinfulness. Uh, no, notice in verse 8, I just want you to think for just a second on verse 8. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. Now I want you to think about what that verse is saying for just a second. Here's what Moses is reminding us and what we need to hear today. Everything is known by God. Everything. God has no secrets. Everything that we know or everything that we've done, everything that we think, everything that we should have done but didn't do, all of that is known by God. That reality, I hope, should terrify us. Because if you're like me, there are things in my life that I don't want anybody else to know. But God knows. God already knows it. Because of that, what we deserve from God is God's wrath. 
and God's judgment. One of the most famous sermons, perhaps you read it in English class in school because it's so famous, is Jonathan Edwards' sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. That sermon gets a lot of bad press because it sounds like it's a, you know, fire and brimstone kind of sermon. But really, if you read it, what Edwards is doing in that sermon, and I think it's something that we tend to forget to do, is remind us that the only reason that we are even allowed to breathe air today is because of God's grace to us. Because of our sinfulness, what we deserve from God, what we are entitled to from God, is His wrath. That's what Psalm 90 reminds us of. That may not sound pleasant, but God's wrath is necessary for God to be holy. If God ceased being wrathful, He would stop being holy. If God stopped being wrathful, He wouldn't be just. And what that does is that reminds us that God hates sin. Sin is not simply a defect of your character. It is an offense against a holy God who is awesome. And because of that, we understand that's why sin is so costly. That's why sin gets the cross. That's why sin earns death. So God is awesome, and we are frail. Two truths that are really hard for us to swallow. And the psalm could end there, and God would still be God, and nothing would be out of balance with the world. But luckily, that's not where the psalm ends. Instead, Psalm 90, verse 12, Teach us to number our days, that we may get a heart of wisdom. We need a wise heart to live in the reality of those two truths, that God is awesome, that we are not, that we are frail and sinful and deserving of God's wrath. So what do we need in a wise heart? What does a wise heart do? Well, first, a wise heart lives each day for God. When it says, teach us to number our days, that doesn't mean that we sit down with a calendar and say, okay, I've lived you know, 17,412 days. That's not what that means. That doesn't mean that you literally number your days. It means you live with an understanding, you live with a reality that your life, every day that you have, is a gift from God. And therefore, you need to live each day for Him. You live with that understanding that the day you have today, you may not get tomorrow. So make the most of the day you have today for the glory of God. Live each day for Him. Live with a a humble heart toward God. Live with a repentant attitude toward God. Don't, Don't live with this presumptuousness that you've got endless amounts of time because you don't. Live each day for him. So a wise heart lives each day for God. Secondly, a wise heart finds satisfaction in Jesus alone. Finds satisfaction in Jesus alone. Notice what it says there in verse 14. Satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love. Now, now it would seem presumptuous to start off by saying satisfy us until you know what you're to be satisfied with. With your steadfast love. Satisfy us, God, with that only that which will ultimately satisfy us. See, there are numerous false idols, false gods in this world that will try to distract us, try to tell us that they can make us happy. And they can't. Some of the most common ones that we face in this world is the false idol of comfort. Oh, if I, if I could just be comfortable... If I, if I could just not have to deal with this problem in my life, if I could just be comfortable in my circumstances, then everything would be fine. It won't. It won't satisfy you. Maybe for a little bit, but ultimately that comfort will become discomfort. Maybe you try to find security in your finances. If only I had so much money. If I could just, if I could just make a few more dollars, I wouldn't have to worry. I could pay everything off and I could live well. It won't happen. It will not satisfy. Or maybe you think health. 
If I could just be healthy, if I, if I could, if I could just, you know, not have this condition, if I could just, you know, if I could just take care of myself, if I could just put a lot of effort into my physical well-being. Nothing wrong with taking care of yourself physically, but you know what I've learned? It doesn't matter how well you take care of yourself, you still end up dead. It's true. Health will disappoint you. Maybe you look for it in happiness. Oh, if I could just be happy, if I could just enjoy myself, if I could just, if I could just have fun, you know, buy some toys, ha- ha- have some fun on the weekends, and, and not have any cares, then, then everything will be fine. You know, the old bumper sticker, he who dies with the most toys wins, really should say, he who dies with the most toys still dead. Okay? You know, I used to say you've never seen a U-Haul behind a hearse. Well, I did see that not long ago, um, actually. But it, it wasn't an actual hearse, but somebody had bought a hearse and had turned it into their car, and they were pulling a little U-Haul trailer. So you can't use that illustration anymore. It's not, it's not true. Or maybe you try to find your satisfaction in relationships. Oh, if I could just have a better marriage, if I could just be a better parent, if I could just have a better family life, if I could just find me a husband, if I could just find me a wife, if I could just get rid of my husband, whatever it might be. Okay? Some of y'all laughed a little hard on that one. We think these things will satisfy us, but they will not. The truth is that Jesus alone can ultimately satisfy us, and a wise heart Find satisfaction in Jesus alone. Now, how does that happen? Well, it tells us there, it says, satisfy us with your steadfast love. Ultimately, we find satisfaction in the gospel. See, when we understand that we deserve God's wrath, but God so loved us that he gave his one and only son to live a perfect life, to die in our place, The theological word for that is propitiation. Here's the beauty of that word. It's a big word, but it's a beautiful word. It's the idea that Jesus didn't just take our place on the cross. He took the punishment that we deserved. He took upon himself all the wrath that God had built up toward our sin, that we deserved all of that wrath. On the cross, Jesus took that wrath upon himself and satisfied the holy righteous, just demands of God. And he makes an offer to us that if we will repent and believe in him, then God's favor is poured out upon us. No longer God's wrath, but God's favor because Jesus took all of it. A good illustration of this is imagine that you were traveling somewhere to where one of these huge dams are built, the massive dam like the Hoover Dam. And you're standing there at the bottom of the Hoover Dam and you look up and you see a small crack form. And water begins to come and the dam begins to collapse. And millions and tr- billions and trillions of gallons of water are heading your way. And you can't get out of the way. There's nowhere you can go. You're doomed. And right before the water gets to you, the ground opens up and swallows every bit. And you don't get a drop on you. It's exactly what happened on the cross. God's wrath was headed our way. And Jesus took it upon himself. And think about that for a second. When you understand how much you've been loved, you can find your satisfaction in Jesus alone. You can rejoice, you can be glad through every area of your life. See, when God has been our dwelling place in all generations, we can rest assured no matter what comes our way. And lastly, a wise heart displays God's work in every area of life. Verses 16 and 17, Let your work be shown to your servants and your glorious power to their children. Let the favor of the Lord our God be upon us and establish the work of our hands. Establish the work of our hands. 
You see, so many times how we approach life is we, we think we can figure it out, and then when we don't, we ask God to fix our problem. Instead of saying, God, I want to do the things that you want me to do so that your work can be seen in every area of my life. God, I want your favor, your desires, your will to be done in my life. See, God alone can make your life count. And your life will only matter if you live it to please God. Life will only matter if you live it with the desire to please God every day of your life. You see, if you please people and displease God, you may have a lot of people come to your funeral, but you failed. If you displease people but please God, you win. See, it's not about doing the things that you want. It's about living your life for the glory of God. God asks, or Moses asks God to establish the work of our hands. The only way it will last, the only way the things of our life will last is if and only if we do them for the Lord. I've shared this poem before in settings, but the last line of it by C.T. Studd is, Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. So do you want your life to matter? I hope you do. Do you want to live with a heart of wisdom? I hope you do. Do you want to be faithful in your life? I hope you do. It begins with giving your life to Jesus. It begins by knowing that God has given you the opportunity to fully commit your life to Him. So we're going to sing a song of response. Um, as a church, we, we believe very strongly that God alone can change us, that He's the only one who can. So this is an opportunity. If, if you need to do business with God, by all means do it. But also know that I'm available if you need someone to pray with you. If you, if you want to talk with me after the service, I'm available. If you have any questions, if you have any any comments that you need to to get off your chest, things that you want to talk about, I'm available throughout the week. By all means, feel free to talk with me about it. This is an opportunity that God has given us to respond to Him. He gives us this life to live for Him. And if we, we, we waste it, if we don't take advantage of the opportunities that God has given to us. So let's pray. Father, thank You that you are awesome, that you are holy, that you are just. And Lord, I know sometimes we, we forget that. We think that we're bigger than we are, but you remind us that we are but dust. Father, teach us to number our days, that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Help us to find our satisfaction in you and not in other stuff. Everything else is temporary, Lord, you alone are eternal. Help us in this moment. If we need to make decisions, if we need to commit our life to you, if we need to recommit our life to you, if we need to to make a decision regarding where we stand with something in our life, Father, help us now to know what we need to do. Lord, if you're working on us and we we need to set up time this week to talk or whatever, Lord, let us know what we need to do so that we can can do what pleases you as we live with a heart of wisdom. Father, we thank you for this glorious day. So as we sing, speak to us, tell us what we need to do. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Let's stand. Let's stand, please.
thing on the order service is announcements, so here's the announcements. Read your bulletin. Okay? Easy enough, right? Um, so as we dismiss today, uh, we want to close uh, with a uh, choral benediction, the chorus of Because He Lives. So sing these words like you mean them because they're true. And, and sometimes we don't feel uh, a certain way, but when we can ground what we know on what's true, then it changes everything. And Jesus lives, and that changes everything about life. So let's close by singing the chorus of Because He Lives. Because he